Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 Answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm with a dear friend of mine, winemaker Kathy Joseph of Fiddlehead Cellars in the San Inez Valley. Welcome, Kathy, and tell us a little bit about Fiddlehead Cellars. Thanks, Allison. Um, Fiddlehead Cellars celebrated 30 years of winemaking this past vintage 2018. And um, it started as a vision to want to try to focus on just a few varietals grown in a special place. After going to grad school at Davis and working with amazing winemakers in Napa, I felt that I needed to do something a little different that would bring recognition and importance to my mission. And so I focused on more or less underdog varietals, Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, um, targeting a first vintage in 1989. And I also sought out to work in districts that were a little lesser known at the time, uh, Santa Barbara County and specifically Santa Rita Hills, which had not yet been established, and also working with Pinot Noir up in the Willamette Valley. Um, My focus was solely Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, and I more recently have expanded to include Gruner Veltliner in the lineup. And I also know that you make um, Rosé of Pinot Noir as well as sparkling wine. Indeed, and that's part of Pinot Noir in my mind, (laughs) is just pursuing all of the facets that I can do. Um, Actually, it's interesting, Pinot... You know, I started very small, 150 cases. Um, I still consider how much I make relatively small, two to 3,000 cases. Um, but the rosé was added long ago in 2004, was our first vintage, way before the craze of rosé. And uh, the idea was to make it because we like to drink it, and it was such a great expression of the grape. Um, sparkling came on board um, in part as an experiment. I own the vineyard called Fiddlesticks Vineyard, and there was an opportunity as I I walked the vineyard trying to assess when I was going to pick my Pinot Noir. There were certain blocks that came on as um, more advanced flavor characteristics that, you know, I believed might be right for a sparkling wine. And until we made our first one, did we kind of confirm that it was a good idea? Um, We make very little sparkling. We make about 100 cases uh, every vintage, Um, with the first vintage, again, being 2008, so so quite a while ago. Hmm. So you said you have Fiddlesticks Vineyard. How many acres is that? And where are you sourcing your other fruit? Do you own other vineyards elsewhere, or are you sourcing from particular places? So Fiddlesticks is um, very specifically in the cool climate district of Santa Rita Hills and importantly on the Southern Avenue, uh, Santa Rosa Road, where there's a lot of clay in the soil. And that really drives character in the wine. I'm pretty much midway in the Appalachian um, and very specifically at mile marker 7.28, which is why I name a wine after um, that 728, um, because it, it is our expression within the district. Cool climate, of course, is essential for the success of Pinot Noir. Um, so I source grapes up in the North Willamette Valley, specifically in the Chehalem Mountains from a very cherished vineyard called Aloro Vineyard. But historically, I worked with probably gosh, eight to 10 other properties within the um, Willamette Valley and and before those (laughs) sub-AVAs came to be. So there's a a wonderful sense of history. Um, And also for Sauvignon Blanc, um, I found that I wanted to make a a style that was less herbaceous. And we learned that the more easterly portion of the San Inez Valley, where we had very warm days and very cool evenings, was extraordinary for successful Bordeaux varieties. And so Sauvignon Blanc is um, contracted from several growers out of the Happy Canyon of Santa Barbara District of San Inez Valley. So what is your first memory relevant to wine? Wow. 
Um, it's a great question, and um, it kind of strikes on, you know, there was no single wine epiphany in my life. Um, wine was a little bit about flavors and aromas, and my mother was a chef, and and I was lucky to inherit her sense of taste and sense of smell very acutely, almost um, to an annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, actually, I think my earliest memory was um, a, a love of sherry because there was always a carafe of sherry on the table. And um, it was something that I was allowed to help myself to. And may, maybe that was the beginning. I'm not sure. Huh. And do you remember the first or most memorable wine you've ever drunk and what that occasion was? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's about... Wine is not only about the wine, but the experience and who you're with. Um, one great experience, one of my mentors is Zelma Long. And um, when I was working in Napa at Joseph Phelps Vineyard long ago, I was renting her home in Angwin. And I think she was stopping by to check on the mail or something. And we had a fire going and she asked if I wanted a glass of wine. And I'm so excited <laughs> secretly that I'm having a glass of wine with Selma. <laughs> and I'm trying to contain myself because it was so special. And I remember uh, she poured uh, Robert Mondavi Cabernet where she had previously been the winemaker and you know, we had a, a mini discussion about the wine, but it was more about us and what we're doing. And the, um, <laughs> I remember wanting more, but I was afraid <laughs> to ask for it <laughs> because it really was about the experience of being together. But, um, you know, one, one of many memorable times that I'm not sure it was about the wine, but the moment. Mm hmm. I'm sure you've had a lot of them, so it'd be hard to pick one out over another. So among all the populations of the world, who do you think drinks the best in terms of quality? That's a really good question. I don't know if I have enough experience to answer that. I still am trying to expand my wine district travels. <laughs> um, I think... One that is especially memorable is Greece, maybe atypical, an atypical answer, because it's it's a lifestyle use of wine. Um, conversation in the bars late at night. I've toured the vineyards and tasted with winemakers there. And um, it's, I don't know, maybe at the time I felt it was less precious than it appears to have become in some areas. So if we were to um, visit your home or one of your homes, because I know you spend time here in San Diego's Valley, but also in Davis, what would we find wine-wise in your cellar? That's another great question. <laughs> <laughs> because for me, it runs the gamut. Um, I'm a, a collector like many people. I probably drink more Pinot Noir um, because I explore what's in the family of what I make from districts around the world. But I'm also gifted a lot of Pinot Noir, um, both made from my property, Fiddlesticks Vineyard, but also from friends that are events um, worldwide. Um, but... I have old Cabernets from the mid-80s um, that I collected when I worked in Napa. Um, every time I taste Cabernet now, I wish it had a little bit more <laughs> bottle age on it. And I'm um, a little sorry the <laughs> style has shifted to make wines so young and fruit forward at, at their release. Um, but... You know, I could have a Spanish wine or an Italian wine or a Greek wine or a screw cap wine or a, I buy wine for interest sake um, or I call it mood wine to have something for what I'm in the mood for. <laughs> and um, I try not to be closed minded about drinking the same thing all of the time. I like to um, really open doors when I collect wine and drink it. 
Well, I remember you telling me once that no matter how much you loved steak, you wouldn't want to eat steak every single day. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to wear the same shirt every day either. <laughs> so I try to share experiences with novices that come through the tasting room and um, people who say, well, what is your favorite wine? And I just want them to break that way of thinking and break the rules um, and drink red with fish and drink <laughs> red first and, and white second. And it really is about diversity, but just one taste often isn't enough. So you have to drill that in to people's way of thinking. And I still believe that to this day. So here's a question for you. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Gosh, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, I think it falls along the same way of thinking. Um, there are varieties that maybe require more attention. I mean, Pinot Noir has transparency. And if the acid and alcohol and fruit balance isn't spot on, it may seem awkward. Um, other wines may be easier to make. But... Perfect is such a bad word. <laughs> In anything, it's really a bad word. So I cannot embrace that suggestion. <laughs> and what is your opinion of wine critics and scores? Oh, gosh, I wish I had a better relationship with many of them. <laughs> because as gregarious as I am often, I feel I'm very shy on um, approaching wine critics and really speaking my mind. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I, I draw on a, a wealth of sources. And um, many times I want to call people out on misinformation. And instead, I just retreat. <laughs> um, wine scores... I always felt that descriptions were more important than wine scores because I could try to connect people to the descriptions that ring their bell. And a score is just a number. And who doesn't want, you know, it was over 90 is great. And then over 95 is spectacular. And, you know, 100 point wines, um, Remember, perfect does perfect exist. <laughs> um, it, it's it's all a matter of a moment and where that wine falls in a lineup of tastings. Um, I was a wine judge for about 15 years on maybe six different competition panels. And I know the bartering that goes on at competitions. And um, I know... <laughs> I just know how award-winning wines sometimes skew bringing great wines to the palates of people who rely so much on competition. So I think wine writers and critics of wine are essential, but I wish they looked more, more critically at the personality and the depth of what the wines they're writing about are all about. So getting down to wine as a consumer, red, white, or rosé? Yes. <laughs> Sparkling or still? Yes. Champagne or domestic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that helped everyone. <laughs> no, I know. Well, like I mentioned, a diverse cellar is so special. So why would I not want a domestic bottle of sparkling wine when it's spectacular? Mm -hmm. um, and not every import, not every French champagne is is delicious. And not even all those expensive ones are. When it's great, um, I usually buy more of it and I don't care in what price point and that's how I build my cellar. I start out with a couple bottles or wine that I've tasted at a restaurant or at a wine tasting event and um, I have, you know, I believe in those wines. So they're wines I want to drink and wines I want to share with friends and family. So a few minutes ago you were talking about how you want to throw caution to the wind and you don't believe in the rules of food and wine pairing, you know, drink red wine with fish and, you know, other, just have fun. But how would you approach food and wine pairing? What are your suggestions to look for? Right. So I'm not sure that's what I said. <laughs> if, I, if I could make a little 
correction there. <laughs> um, I what what I think I said is that it's okay to break the rules, and yes. that food and wine pairing is important because it gives greater pleasure. Um, to the pairing than to the pieces. Um, I'm a, a real believer in that. Um, and, and really there are some wines that are great just sipping on and there's some wines that become so much better when they're partnered with food. Um, one example that comes to mind about food and wine pairings is I make a, a special style of Sauvignon Blanc. I think of it a little bit akin to a Bordeaux white. Um, it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc that's barrel aged and released with excessive bottle age. It's called Honeysuckle. Um, it is made from 100% new French oak where it's aged, but my mission is to disguise the oak so you would never know that. And oftentimes people ask if there's any oak on it. Now, Personally, I don't get tremendous pleasure on just sipping on that wine. But if you were to give me a big plate of pasta carbonara, mm -hmm. I think I would be just in heaven <laughs> because of how well those um, pairs go together, the wine and the food. What are the rules? I think... Um, you don't want to overpower each other. So Pinot Noir probably would be lost on a pepper steak, but would be stunning with spicy Thai food. So it's the maybe the weight of the food and the weight of the wine. A very young, fruity wine, uh, very youthful in its life, might not go great with a kind of a savory style duck in au jus. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look for pairings where I would say, oh, that's great. Now, really, you could have scrambled eggs and find a great Zinfandel. I mean, seriously. <laughs> and that might not be what you really think goes. Now, I have a very broad cellar and I'm lucky because I can pop the cork on a bottle of wine, taste it, and say, this isn't what I'm looking for, and I would rather put it away and find the right pairing than feel compelled to finish that bottle of wine. So um, since I know you host some great parties, you have your um, pink party where you release your rosé, you have your 728 party on July 28th to celebrate the vineyard, um, there tends to be a lot of drinking and sometimes it's more than wine. Uh, the next day, um, <laughs> the next day, it is not uncommon to have a little hangover. So I'm wondering if you have any tips or cures that you suggest. My tip is to stay hydrated throughout your enjoyment of these fabulous beverages. <laughs> and sometimes you forget to do that. But I actually think you might not feel um, like that the next day if you it, it isn't total volume if you have adequate timing it's kind of just um, the pace at which you're consuming <laughs> other than that um, everyone overindulges once in a while and you don't want to miss that moment of pure pleasure so just stay in bed and ride it out <laughs> So what do you think a non-drinker loses out on by not tasting your wines? Well, it's interesting because as a winemaker, I find um, um, texture to be so important. And, and there are pieces to wines. There's aromatics and even non-wine drinkers. I sometimes do want to, if they're comfortable, share the diversity of aromatics of, of like wines and to kind of show how exciting that expression is. I would never force someone to <laughs> drink if it's not in their lifestyle. I mean, um, it's just not what I do. Um, but texture in wine and and um, the length of wine and the weight of wine and textures being driven by tannin and acid combinations um, is so exciting. And um, I think as a winemaker, I probably give higher importance to the texture than I do to the aromatics. So if space aliens were to land out on your vineyard at mile marker seven. 
Uh, what wine would you want to give them from your cellar to taste or from your tasting room to taste? Well, what time of day are they arriving? <laughs> Um, and it might be, you know, whatever I just opened or whatever I have. Um, but if sky's the limit, mm -hmm. you know, I, I make this wine that I say focuses on the purity of the grape. And I select it because it has such pure balance. There's no oak on the wine. It's not high alcohol. Um, it's another Sauvignon Blanc that I make that is strictly stainless fermented. I consider it a reserve selection. It's called Gooseberry. And so when I make wine, I like to provide opportunity. And so, um, initially in the, in the processing fermentation stages, I want some in oak, French oak, and some in neutral oak, and some in new oak, and some in stainless. And not every wine in stainless shows that extreme successful balance. And so I find that that's a wine that just rings everyone's bell immediately. <laughs> and, you know, it's so good right away. So I think that might be a good start. Okay. So vintage, um, every vintage tells a different story. But do you feel that in all the years you've been doing this 30 years, do you see more similarities from one year to the next? Or do you really see a variation from vintage to vintage? Great question. And it's way too generic. Um, <laughs> and the reason is because I make wines in a lot of different places. And I do that because I think it helps me make better wine. The experience in different places helps me problem solve better. So... Um, I'm going to compare my Santa Rita Hills to my Oregon Pinot Noir experience. And I think the glory of Santa Rita Hills is that weather patterns um, are pretty predictable. Um, we harvest earlier season, even though we probably have equal hang time. Everything happens just earlier um, because of our latitude. And I think winemakers might more consistently make similar decisions. Now, some vintages are different. And I think over the years, I've learned how to know what to look for and feel very good about that gut decision on what makes a good wine in a particular vintage. And um, I do nothing the same every two years. So I'm always looking for what's to pick what's ripe when it's ready. Now, in Oregon, the challenge is um, very vintage to vintage, and sometimes we have later season vintages, and sometimes the, the dynamics of how the grapes taste and how the vineyard performs, we have to do things differently in the vineyard. We might drop more crop, we might pull more leaves, we might um, shoot for a lower alcohol balance, which means we want everything in sync. And so I'm very comfortable with differences in vintages. And I think it just depends where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you um, have any uh, signs or omens that you look for to determine what a harvest is going to be? Nope. My mission <laughs> is to make a great wine every harvest. And it's hard to explain to someone... Um, that that there really isn't a bad vintage. Um, but that has to do with how I approach um, making the wine. So, you know, I probably have 15 factors that I look for. And the last one is maybe what's the sugar? You know, um, how does it taste? Uh, uh, the maturity of the tannins is the, you know, seed uh, lignified. Uh, there, there's many things that I'm looking for. Um, and... I look back on the vintages and when I have, you know, I, at my anniversary of 30 years, I poured huge verticals, you know, 10 to 12 uh, vintages in a row. And when so many are successful, um, I, at the time, I think one being a little warmer, one being earlier, isn't what made it a great vintage. It was the choices that I made that was specific to that vintage that made it successful. Do you have any good luck rituals that you do before harvest is about to start? Well, I kind of like to rally the team by pulling out a previous vintage and toasting with it um, to bring good luck to the new vintage. That's a good ritual. So 
Many winemakers have been known to walk through their vineyards and talk to the grapes or to be in the cellars and to sing or talk to their wines. Do you um, talk to your grapes? you talk to your wines when they're in the barrel? And if so, what do you say to them? <laughs> no, I'm not that silly. Um, I think I talk to myself and I try to reason with myself what I should be doing to be successful. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> so Kathy, when you were a little girl, what did you want to be when you grew up? Or did you always know this was the path for you? No, I always knew I was going to be a physician, <laughs> a doctor. <laughs> and I never became a doctor. The reason I knew that, um, I was um, very good at science. And I always looked at science as an art form. And I had a great family mentor that uh, actually guaranteed me a job out of medical school. I never made it to medical <laughs> school and I never got that job. But I learned my education and my experience um, training in, in Napa and Sonoma partnered so well to be interested in winemaking. And, you know, when I started, I was pretty young and I didn't care if it worked or not. So it was driven by if I'm doing the right thing, I'll stay at it. And if I'm not, I'm young enough to look for another career. And um, winemaking and grape growing has been not only challenging, um, it's become spiritual. It's a lifestyle. It's a thrill in my life. I, I continue to love every day in spite of, um, having to deal with employees. <laughs> um, and I find very few people can kind of keep up with my, um, energy level because I'm so thrilled by, by what I, I do in life. Oh, that's great. So when you're not working, how do you spend your free time? Well, I, I don't work. I, it's a lifestyle, remember? And so, um, you know, going to restaurants and enjoying a great bottle of wine, um, eating, drinking, travel. Um, I like exercise. I love to cycle. I love art. So traveling museums around the world. Um, family is hugely important. So family celebrations. Um, and I, Mm, I was going to say I don't say no to too many things, but I don't do extreme <laughs> thrill-seeking type things because um, somehow for me, I keep that in check. <laughs> so no bungee jumping in your future. <laughs> <laughs> Not this week, at least. <laughs> and for a really romantic evening, what wine would you order? I don't know if it's the wine that creates the romance. Um <laughs> My great memory is a New Year's Eve dinner I made uh, for me and my husband. And we set up a table in front of a little table in front of the fireplace. And I crawled around my cellar. And I believe it was a maybe $10 bottle of Ridge Montebella that was from the mid 80s or something. <laughs> And it could not have gotten more romantic than that. <laughs> I'm not asking anymore. <laughs> so I have to ask, just based here in Santa Barbara and, and because of the fame of a, a certain uh, film that came out, but do you have a favorite film dedicated to wine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one that has my bottle in it. Yes. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to have been part of Sideways and had a wine that was talked about at length. The funny thing was it was Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> Pinot Noir um, was in the background, the label, my vineyard, you know, you saw my hills. Um, and through that experience, I've been lucky enough to have my brand and my label show up in a whole slew of um, movies. And um, the movies that are only about wine, in my opinion, are a little bit limiting, and um, and they're created by people who have kind of a, a, a focused mission that I don't necessarily believe in. Um, so no, I wouldn't support <laughs> <laughs> any of those new releases. <laughs> but Sideways does hold a very special part here. Well, uh, let's see. That was... Um, More than 10 years ago. 
uh, way more. I think it's more like 14 years ago. And um, the fact that people still talk about it makes it important. I don't even know if they know the details, but it starts conversation. And quite frankly, it got people, um, it gave them permission to say and drink Pinot Noir. So what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? To follow my dream. That was probably from my dad. (laughs) (laughs) And if you could give our listeners a piece of advice, I know you've given some good advice throughout our conversation, um, but I don't know if you want to reiterate something or if there's some piece of advice, a new piece of advice you'd like to share. Yeah, I I just want to go back to the advice question because I do try to mentor um, others interested in becoming winemakers and grape growers. And um, for many years, I taught the business of winemaking, and I approached that with a very practical hat. Um, it's not easy going, and it's our job to make um, the world of wine seem completely pleasurable, which for me it is, but it's um, tremendously competitive, and it's a lot of hard work. And you have to be able to accept criticism and you have to learn from as many people as you can. And um, I think that if it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Um, There are lots of different facets, marketing and winemaking and grape growing, and you have to know them all. But um, it's, it's just be prepared for the work. The only a handful of people become successful overnight. And even though I think they may not deserve it, it's not going to happen to most of us. <laughs> what would you say your proudest achievement is to date in your work? Let's see. That's a tough question for me because I'm so driven and... I think my proudest achievement is through thick and thin, I've been in business for 30 years and I just have to be proud of that. I agree. I think it's a huge accomplishment. And um, considering you were one of the first people here in Santa Barbara, that's longevity. And and when you started, how many wineries were here and how many are here today? Oh, gosh, I don't keep track of numbers, but I wasn't the first. Uh, The reason I came to the area because there were enough pioneers that made good wine uh, for me to believe in the area and to believe that as a, as a group, we could elevate the success of the area. There was a lot of bad wine as well. And so you had to sort of, sort of pick your path and make it happen. I would say, I, I really don't know. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there were 30 wineries and now there's hundreds. I really don't know. A lot of um, small producers making 50 cases, 200 cases, um, and then you have much bigger interest in the area that is important to bring their connections here as well and recognition to this area as well. So I'm I'm grateful at all levels, and I try to um, be part of all of that. Um, It's important. So complete the sentence for me. A table without wine is like? A table without wine is sad. (laughs) Um, Disappointing, a missed moment. Um, It probably could be better with wine on the table. (laughs) So the paparazzi snap a photo of um, a VIP sitting in a restaurant. And in the back of that photo is a bottle of your wine sitting on the table. From any walk of life, who would you want that VIP to be? (laughs) You know... The reality is, um, I'm going to bring this back to the very first question about wine writers. Mm -hmm. So um, without naming names, it would be great if it it was a superbly influential wine writer. (laughs) Um, But my wine is meant to be for people. And when I walk by a table in a restaurant and I see someone enjoying my wine, I stop and have a conversation because it's a connection. So, you know, it's it's the fact the wine is there, not who it is. Do you think we'll be drinking in 200 years, a thousand years? Um, do you think we'll be drinking similar to what we're drinking now? Ooh, I think we'll definitely be drinking because it makes 
for happy people. It's a it's such a pleasurable life um, part, a lifestyle type thing. Whether it's the same has to do with disease in the vineyards, um, new varietals, mutations at the vine level. I think there's always people um, who are bringing out historic varietals and reminding us how important they are or why they disappeared because they're, <laughs> they're not great standalone wines. I think it will be a different mix for sure. Some, some the same and some different. What is one winemaking area in the world that you would like to explore still? <laughs> Um, again, I think there's many. I'll be doing a river cruise on the Danube soon um, in uh, March of 2020. Love everyone to come join me. <laughs> um, but I will be in districts that I haven't been. Um, I think we hit Poland. <laughs> I have yet to go to South America. It's high on my list, but I uh, have had many more of those wines. Um, so there's many that I need to learn about. I just think it's always an open door for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you had to be sent off to a deserted island and take three bottles with you, <laughs> I know it's a challenging question with the diversity, but what three wines would come to mind? <laughs> well, um, that's a funny question because I, I first want to say a wine that would age well, but I probably would drink <laughs> bring, tr drink it in three days. So, um, <laughs> you know, if I had to, yeah, if it aged well, I could take a little sip every day and um, even with a little exposure to air. So, and I would want a wine that tastes good right now because I'd be frustrated having to wait. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I'd want a wine that has a, um, a little bottle age. I, I, you know, it's not fair. I think of my wines um, because they have withstood the test of time. So I release them with bottle age. And here we are, you know, 30 year, years later. And they, they still, to me, have great balance. And they've, I'm sure, have tasted different over the course of time, but always satisfying. So... I would have to think about what other wines in the vein in which I make mine, I would find out there. That's a nice way to avoid answering that question. <laughs> okay, so the last thing we do, because we're almost finished, is um, we play a little game of wine and music because we know how much the two play in. So based on some of the wines, if you just tell me the style of music or a particular song that a, that a wine of yours makes you think of so <laughs> the look of fear on your face <laughs> okay. well well let's start with your 728 pinot noir i am going to frustrate you because i'm not going to answer the question <laughs> and i'll tell you why because remember about mood wine and what you're in the mood for and you can make the wine be what you want it to be so I recently did this fun little video that says, like, sometimes you want to rock and roll and <laughs> sometimes you want to turn on um, Beethoven and dream to and sway to. And sometimes you want Yo-Yo Ma's cello going and and sometimes, you know, you want, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not very <laughs> musical of late. But so I feel like I can make wine fit the mood. I don't think the the wine only is one kind of music. I think I can make rosé be any of those. <laughs> and so, again, I feel like maybe you're making me want to tunnel in a wine to be one thing when I look at it as being, you know, a rainbow of things. Well, on that note, we will end on the rainbow. And Kathy, I want to thank you for joining us today. And before we go, if you can let everyone know where are your wines available and both in the market around the country, as well as can they find you here? Thank you, Allison. It's been such a pleasure <laughs> and you really make me be introspective with my answers. Um, I would love everyone to, to um, try Fiddlehead. Um, it is most available through my website, which is fiddleheadsellers.com. 
Um, if you ever are in Lompoc in my neck of the woods, you may find that I'll be answering the phone and I'd love to tour you <laughs> on uh, the vineyard and, and what makes my wine special. Right now, I do little export, um, but that may change in the future. Um, recently, I've had some interest in Japan, actually. Exporting is expensive, so um, buy a case at a minimum. <laughs> Thank you again, Allison. <laughs> and um, are your wines available in markets across the country? They are. Um, we both direct ship and distribute um, through distributors across the country. So we're licensed in many states. If you don't see us in your retail store or restaurant, ask them to bring it in or come onto our website. We list, um, gosh, probably 15 or 20 states where we can direct ship to. Fantastic. Well, Kathy, again, thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> back. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.